In that two-step example, we can see that initially the production of the intermediate was faster than its consumption, so the concentration of the intermediate grew. Eventually, as the amount of the reactants decreased, so does the rate of production of that intermediate. Therefore, over time, the consumption of the intermediate outgrows the rate of its production, and therefore its concentration will then begin to decrease. This trend means that there is a time at which there would be a maximum amount of the intermediate that will exist in the system. It is useful to be able to determine the time at which that maximum concentration occurs. If the integrated rate law expression is known, then setting its derivative with respect to time to be equal to zero will give when the concentration of the intermediate will be at a maximum. So, given that we can use the first derivative test to find local extrema, let's then apply that concept to determine the maxima for our intermediate. So returning again to our example where we're looking at a reaction where we start with supercoiled DNA that then turns into some intermediate, which in this case is open circle DNA, that then converts into linear DNA. Our question then is how long after the initialization of the reaction should we say extract the open circle DNA to get an maximum amount? And so the premise behind this question is that once you initiate this reaction, you start with supercoiled DNA, what you want in the end is to have the open circle DNA. You don't really need the linear DNA in the end at all. And so the question is then asking, after you initialize, at what point do you then stop the reaction, or what point do you do your extraction so that you can then get out the maximum amount of the component that you actually want, this open circle DNA? Then let's apply our first derivative test. What that means is that I'm going to set the rate of change of the open circle DNA with respect to time to be equal to zero. And since I know my integrated rate law expression for my concentration of open circle DNA, I'm just going to plug that in. So d by dt of the first rate constant divided by the second rate constant minus the first rate constant, and that's going to be times the exponent raised to the power of negative of the first rate constant times time minus the exponent of the, the negative of the second rate constant times time, and that again is going to be equal to zero. Applying the differential to this expression, well, I can basically take out the constants, which is just these rate constants, the kf1 divided by kf2 minus kf1. And so then I can then apply my differential to the first term. I have an exponent raised to some power, so I can take down then the constant in that power. So I'm going to get minus the times the first rate constant times e raised to the power of the negative of the first rate constant times time. I get the same thing, I get e raised to some exponential, and so that I can get the constant and that exponential coming down, which means that in this case I have minus minus, which gives me plus the second rate constant, e raised to the power of the negative of the second rate constant times time. And again, that's all equal to zero. And so in this case, what I can do is I can divide both sides by the first rate constant. I can multiply both sides by the second rate constant minus the first rate constant. And so I can essentially then just cross off these two terms because they're going to be multiplied by zero on the other side. And so I can then rearrange where I can move then this negative term and I can move it to the right hand side. And so what that leaves me with is the second rate constant times e raised to the power of the negative of the second rate constant times time, and that's equal to the first rate constant times e raised to the power of the negative of the first rate constant times time. I'm going to continue to simplify, so I'm going to divide both sides by the second rate constant, and I'm also going to divide both sides by e raised to the power of negative kf1t, and so essentially what I'm trying to do is move this term over to the left-hand side, and I'm going to move this term over to the right-hand side. And so what I'm left with is e raised to the power of the negative of the second rate constant times time times e raised to the power of the first rate constant times time. And the reason why there's no negative sign here is that when I divide both sides by e to the negative of kf1t, well, 1 over e raised to the power of a negative of an exponent is just e raised to the power of the positive of that exponent. On my right-hand side, I get kf1 divided by kf2. I continue to simplify. I have these two exponent terms on the left, and so it's the same as essentially taking 
When I multiply them together, then I can add together their exponents. So I get e raised to the power of kf1 minus kf2 through the distributive principle, and that's multiplied by t. And on my right-hand side, I still get kf1 over kf2. Now I can take the natural logarithm of both sides, and so what I get on my left-hand side is kf1 minus kf2. And I'll re-add in my terms up here, and that's still times t. And over here I have the natural logarithm of kf1 divided by kf2. Finally, I'm going to solve for t. And so all that means then is that my t max, because that's what I've always been solving for here since I set my derivative to be equal to 0. But my t max is then equal to 1 over kf1 minus kf2 times the natural logarithm of the first rate constant divided by the second rate constant. Now let's apply this result to our plot here to see if we get something that's consistent. So when I drew this plot, I said that the relationship between the two rate constants is such that the second rate constant is about 99% of the first rate constant. And so what that means for our expression here, and I'll do this in blue, is that when I substitute in for t max, then I'm going to say, well, 1 over and I'm still going to have the first rate constant, but from that I'm going to subtract off 0.99 um, k1 for the first rate constant, just to, just to substitute in for the second rate constant to simplify this. And the same thing with our natural logarithm. I'm going to have the natural logarithm of the first rate constant divided by 0.99 times the first rate constant, meaning I'm substituting that in for the second rate constant. Um, in that case, I can then cross off my first rate constant here, and I'm going to distribute out, or I'm going to basically do the math there for that, that term underneath. So I'm going to have t max is equal to 1 over 0 0.01 times the first rate constant times the natural logarithm of 1 over 0 0.99. And in the end, what I'm going to get is my t max is going to be equal to 1.005 divided by the first rate constant. And if we go and look up at our plot, we can see that our x-axis is denominated in units of kf1 times time. And this was just so that I can do a trick like this, where I can just set a relationship between the two rate constants so I can plot these diagrams. But I can then just write my solution here as that first rate constant times t max, and that's equal to 1.005. And if we look at our plot here, well, our maximum is going to be right here of this intermediate, which again is the open circle DNA. And if I draw this down to the line, well that's approximately equal to 1, which is what our, our answer is. And so based on the solution, we can see the consistency um, from the solution that we got for the integrated rate law expression for the concentration of open circle DNA, leading us back to our solution here that if we knew our forward rate constant and the relationship between the two rate constants, we would be able to determine what is this maximum, or what is the time at which we would have a maximum amount of our intermediate so that we would know when to stop the reaction and extract it if that is what we wanted to do. When the overall reaction rate is determined by a single step, we call that the rate determining step. It is the slowest step that is critical to the formation of products. Note that it isn't just necessarily the slowest step, since there may be a faster, parallel reaction pathway making that slow step irrelevant. The rate determining step serves as a bottleneck in the reaction. The two figures below demonstrate the rate determining step for a conversion of supercoiled DNA to linear DNA reaction scheme. Since there is only one pathway, the slowest step will be our rate determining step. In the figure on the left, the rate constant for the first reaction is 10 times larger than the rate constant of the second reaction. This means that the second step is rate determining. We can see the effects on this in the plot of the integrated rate law expressions, where the concentration of supercoiled DNA drops quickly and the intermediate open circle DNA persists in the system for a long time. In the figure on the right, the rate constant for the first reaction is 10 times smaller than the rate constant of the second reaction. This means that the first step is rate determining. We can see the effect on this of the plot in the integrated rate law expressions where the supercoiled DNA persists for a long time 
and that when any of the open circle DNA or the intermediate is formed, it's quickly consumed to form the linear DNA. As a result, the concentration of the intermediate at any time is small. A second example, our hydrogen peroxide reaction scheme, the rate law expression was experimentally found to be the rate of the reaction is equal to a rate constant times the concentration of hydrogen peroxide times the concentration of iodide ions. Even though the reaction mechanism potentially follows two elementary steps, the overall rate law expression matches the first step and can be explained by the fact that the first rate constant is much smaller than the second rate constant. Assuming that there are no other parallel pathways, the first step is rate determining for this reaction.